Hi, my name's Stuart Lynch, and this is the second in a series of videos on scheduling and responding to local notifications in Swift. In this video, our focus will be on time interval notifications. We'll start by forming a local notification request, and then in order to execute the notification, we'll need to form a trigger based on that time interval. Once we have those components in place, we need to schedule it by adding it to the notification queue. And we'll also make sure that we see our notification when the app is in the foreground as well as when the app's in the background. We'll also learn how we can get a list of pending requests and how we can delete one or more of them at a time. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. In order to understand how to form a request, let's take a look at the documentation for Notification Center. If I scroll down, I can click on the Scheduling a Notification Locally from your app link. From here, let's go to this section where you're told how to create and register a notification request. Let's find out what a request is. I see that it has three parts. A unique identifier, which is a string, some content, and a trigger. Let's drill down on content and further to review the properties. There are many, and we will eventually add a number of these to our project. I won't go into all of them, but hopefully by the end of the series, you'll have enough confidence to be able to add in whichever of these will meet your own specific needs. For this introduction, we're only going to require a title and a body. And because we want to hear when we get notifications, a sound. Returning back to the request page, let's drill down on the trigger property. There are four types, and in this series we'll only cover the first two. The time interval trigger, which we're doing in this video, and the calendar notification trigger, which will be in the next one. Drilling down on the time interval trigger, we see that it needs an interval and some indication as to whether or not it repeats, and this is a Boolean property. The time interval, as I see, is a double. We'll look at these properties of a calendar notification trigger in the next video. What I want to do is to create a model that I can use for all of my local notifications, and this model will contain properties that will allow me to create and schedule from within my app. So let me start by creating a model and a struct and add only those properties required for a time interval trigger notification. So create a new file called local notification and in there create a struct with the same name. Now we're going to add the properties as explained in the help. We'll need an identifier, which is a string, a title, which is another string, the body, once more, a string, a time interval, which we saw needs to be a double, and repeats, which is that Boolean. Next, we need to be able to schedule that notification. So remember that we'll need the content, the trigger, and a request itself that will contain the identifier, the content, and the trigger. In the Manager class, create a new function called Schedule that will have one parameter, a local notification. We can create an empty instance of content object, which is a UN mutable notification content object. Now we can assign the content properties of title and body from our instance of the local notification. For the content sound, I'm just going to use the default sound. Now I've had some issues with iOS 15 and getting custom local notification sounds to work. So I'm not going to be covering those here, but I have had them working in older apps, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on here in Swift UI with iOS 15. Well, that's all the content we have. So we can set a trigger, which is a UN time interval notification trigger, and it requires a time interval, which is our local notifications time interval, and the repeats is going to be the local notifications repeats boolean value.
The request is a UN notification request. And the identifier is our local notification identifier with the content being our defined content, the trigger being our defined trigger. So now we can execute the notification center's add request function. But we want to use the asynchronous version so that we can throw an error. So we'll use try question mark because I don't really care about the IR. And because it's asynchronous, we have to await the response. Of course, we'll need to mark this function as being asynchronous as well. We no longer need this print statement here, so let's remove it. Returning now to our content view, we can create a new local notification for testing. And we'll call that schedule function with that notification. However, since this is an asynchronous function, we'll need to create a task unit of work in our button action. So for our sample local notification, we'll create our identifier using a UUID UUID string. And that's going to be guaranteed to be unique for every notification. For now, let's just add some fixed string for both the title and the body. And I'm going to set the time interval to 5 seconds. And I'll set the repeat to false. And now I can make a call to our manager's schedule function, passing in that local notification, and make it await as it's asynchronous. Let me test. I'll schedule the notification. And if I wait five seconds, nothing happens. Is that strange? No, that's the expected result. By default, notifications are only presented if your app is in the background. So we can try that out again, but exit to the background. Five seconds later, it works. If you want your app to show notifications while it's in the foreground, you'll need to implement a UN User Notification Center delegate function to our manager class. First, we'll add UN User Notification Center delegate to our class, but we're told that it must conform to NS object. So we need to add that, and it has to be the first conformance. Now, we'll need to let the delegate class know that this class is the delegate to handle the functions. And we can do that in an initializer, so that we can say that the Notification Center delegate is itself. However, this requires that the initializer be an override initializer. And we'll also have to call super init first. With that in place, we can now create the user notification center will present delegate function. This is an asynchronous function that returns the options that we want. Now, we could return sound and banner. Strange that that's not alert just as we created for our request for authorization. We're going to forget the badge. Let's test again. We'll schedule the notification. And then five seconds later, it's presented while the app is in the foreground. Well, what I'd like to do now is to display all of my pending requests in the list below my buttons. And we can store these requests in an array in our Notification Manager class, and we'll do that as a publish property so that when it changes, our list will update. So we'll add that new publish property called Pending Requests that will be an array of UN notification requests, and it will be initialized as an empty array. Next, we'll call a Notification Asynchronous function, so we'll create a new function called Get Pending Requests that is asynchronous. And then you can update pending requests by awaiting the result of the Notification Center's pending notification request function. As you can see that we're using the asynchronous version. Let's also print to the console the number of requests that we have. Now, each time we schedule a notification, we want to get the pending request. So in the schedule notification function,
we can await the call to that function. The delegate function gets called every time a notification is posted, so we must call it here too. And then in the onChange function for our state change, every time we enter the foreground or go into the background, we'd like to see how many pending requests there are here too. So we can call the function here, making sure that we await the result because we're calling an asynchronous function within a task block. Let's increase our time interval to 10 and run a couple of tests. On launch, I see zero pending. Let me add two. I see two here now. And if I wait long enough, each time I trigger, the count will get reduced and our console updates. Now it's time to build our list. But first, let's change the name of our content view to Notifications List View. Make sure you also rename the preview. So we can replace this comment with our actual list now, and it needs to iterate over that array of pending requests in our manager class. We'll start with a list, and then a for each loop on that property, where the ID is the identifier key path because it is a unique property. And this gives us a request to iterate over. I'm going to create a V stack with an alignment of leading. And then I'll create a text view and display the requests.content.title. Below that, I'll create an H stack. I'm going to create a text view that will display the request identifier. Remember, that's a UUID string. And I'll reduce the size by setting the font to a caption size. And let me change the foreground color to secondary. So let's test. I'm going to add three notifications, and each with a few seconds between them. Let me exit to the home screen. Then, after the trigger, let me open the app and see that I'm down to two notifications. Shortly after the second ones, we are down to one. And that one soon disappears as well. Now, sometimes we might schedule a request and want to delete it. All we need to know is the identifier. So for this, we'll use the notification center's remove pending notification requests with identifier function, and it isn't asynchronous. So we'll create a new function in the manager class called remove request with a parameter that will be a single identifier, which is a string. We can then call this function from the notification center, but it is expecting an array of identifier. So we can just put our identifier in an array as a single element, as we're only removing one at a time. And then we can update our array by finding the index where the identifiers match, and then use the remove all at index function on the pending requests array. And then finally, print out the pending request count once more. Back in our list view, we can add a swipe action for the row in our for each loop. We'll make it a button with a label of delete, but we'll make the role destructive. And then for the action, we can now call that location manager's remove request function, passing in the request identifier. Let me test. I'll create two notifications. And let me swipe to delete one. And I see that the pending count decreases to one as well. That leaves us only with one. And that's the only request that gets fired. Now, sometimes we want to delete all at once. Well, there's a convenience function for that too. 
First though, let me add a toolbar. And within the toolbar, I'll add a toolbar item that has a placement of navigation bar trailing. And then for the label, I'll use a system image with the name clear.fill. And I'll increase the size so that I can use an image scale of large. Now we need an action. So back in our manager class, I'm going to create a new function called clear requests. And this function will call the notification center remove all pending notification requests function. And then I can also remove them all from our array using the arrays remove all function. And again, print out the request count once more. So if I return to our list view, we can call this function from the action on our toolbar button. Let's test. I'm going to add three notifications. And then before any of them fire, I'm going to tap on that toolbar button and all three get removed and our pending requests are down to zero. Now there's one more thing I want to show you and that's the repeating nature of a request. I discovered a mistake in my schedule function in Location Manager. As you see, I've hard-coded the repeat to false. It should be whatever I specified in our local notification instance that's passed in. So I'll change that. Now, back in our list view, when we construct our local notification, I'm going to change the repeat property to true instead and test it out. I get a crash. Now, if I scroll up to the top of the console, I see the reason. It says that a time interval must be at least 60 seconds if we're repeating. So let's do that and test again. I'll speed up the video so that we're not waiting for a full minute. When the notification triggers, the notification automatically reschedules itself with the same arguments. In order to delete this, I'm going to have to either swipe to delete or clear all. Well, that's enough for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at how we can schedule notifications for a specific time on a specific day. We'll also take a look at some of the other content properties that we might want to add to our local notifications.